All right. It's been a year or two. I'm back here with Blake Jones, who's one of my business. I climb to the mountaintop and ask some dumb business questions of you every couple of years. So what's, so maybe just tell us your sort of, how did you get into this sort of how to create a mindful business stuff? I think by accident, to be honest, mm -hmm. we started Namaste Solar, three of us did, about 13 years ago, and we were first time very naive entrepreneurs, and, and we didn't have any positive role models that we were trying to That's a big one for this conversation. There's so few people yeah. to look to. Yeah, and, and at that time, I think part of it might have been uh, it's harder to find those positive role models. Part of it might have been we were just naive and didn't know what we were doing. And, like most uh, entrepreneurs. Yes. Yeah. But instead, we, we drew on a lot of our experiences um, before then on what what we didn't want to do. You know, negative role models saying, like, hey, there's got to be a better way to, to do it than this. Like, what did you not want to do? You know, the, the stuffy corporate environments where, you know, it, for me, it used to be I'd go one place to make money and I, I wouldn't be my authentic self. I'd go somewhere else to pursue a hobby, somewhere else to hang out with friends, somewhere else to do community service. Yeah. Um, we wanted a place where you could do all those things under one roof. You could be that. your true self, and, and it didn't have the, the normal power dynamics. It didn't have the, you know, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't like The Office, like what you see on the, right. on the TV show that just makes fun of right. those corporate environments that feel so stuffy and stuff. Right. And they don't even have the laugh track or whatever. Right. So what you just said is one of the most exciting things to me in the whole world, which is that Historically, we have all been born into this world, the society that splits stuff into you can make a profit and have an awful time and exploit the planet, which is what's getting us into all this trouble, yeah. war or climate change or whatever. Or you can be a good person, maybe a teacher or whatever, but you're going to make awful money, which is what my mom did. And that split is so unhealthy. And there's been different remedies like B Corp, which I know you know all about, or whatever else. So that's what we're here to talk about, how to join what Buddhists call right livelihood, doing well and doing good, not making a choice. Yep. Yeah, so we, we experimented with some things. Uh, most of it worked out, some of it didn't. You know, right. you gotta, it's okay to have try some things out and have them not work out. But we were really passionate about employee ownership. That's, a, yeah. that's, that's first and foremost. We didn't want employees. We from the beginning. Employee owners, from the very beginning. And to be clear, Namaste Solar, you know, you're walking around the roof with uh, solar panels with President Obama and Vice President Biden. Like, this was a big deal. This wasn't just like a little shop. This was a big deal, prominent enterprise. Yeah, I think I think we're still considered a small a small shop, a small business. You know, even even today, after 13 years, we're sure. 175 people. It's still a small business. Right. But for us, I like, have 30 staff, and I tell everyone we're a big deal. So. Right. <laughs> but for us. It, and, and for me, in, in, or I'll personalize and say, for me, it's more about the qualitative aspects than the quantitative. You know, right. We wanted to have a positive impact exactly. in the world in a qualitative way, not necessarily in a quantitative way of how many solar panels right. can we install, how, much, how many tons of carbon can we offset. It was more I'm just going to make up a term. You want it to be a small giant. I yeah. just came up with that. Yeah. 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 Trademark that. Yeah. 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 I'll write a book. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so employee ownership was, was a big part of that. We wanted, we wanted to share the entire experience of being a small business owner. And not just the good stuff, you know, sharing the control and the access to the information and the profits, but also the tough stuff, the, the responsibility, the accountability, the sleepless nights, the, the financial risk that you take when you're a small business owner. So using CJ, who's the producer of this video behind here as an example, so if I'm the owner of Elephant, which I am, I would say you get a percentage of the profits, you get a percentage of the stress of, you know, the accountability of running the business. It would be more like, CJ, do you want to be partners with me? Do you uh -huh. want to be my business partner? Uh -huh. uh, but you say it to everybody, not to just everybody. one person. That's right. yep. So everyone who joins Thomas Solar gets that opportunity to say, hey, I'd like to be a uh -huh. co-owner, co as we call it. And so they can't say, no, I just want to be an employee. Sure they can. Oh, okay. yeah. Yep. In the beginning, we didn't want that, but we've evolved to allow for people to say, hey, I want to go back to school next year. I just want to work for the summer or something like that. It's okay for somebody to just to, to want to be an employee. Our preference, though, is for someone to want to become a, a co-owner. So if I apply for a job. You make a major mistake and hire me. Um, and I say, yes, I will take door number one, which is employee owner. And then what does that look like? I get a paycheck. You, but... you, you go through a 12-month candidacy period. Okay. You're called a candidate. You're assigned a mentor, someone who's an existing co-owner to, to be your mentor. And you go through a, a, a candidate curriculum where you learn it's maybe a two dozen 
point checklist where you learn things like financial literacy. Some people don't know how to read financial statements. If you're going to be a business owner, it's good to learn. Yeah, how to I have to learn all statements. that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm still bad. A at lot that. of things that many entrepreneurs learn on the fly. Yeah. And so we, we have the opportunity to say, hey, we learned these things. We, wow. we can we can teach you before. And, and partly it's to help them know what they're getting into. Uh, partly it's to help prepare them for what it is to be uh, an informed, uh, knowledgeable small business owner, an engaged small business owner. Uh, but but it is a, a get to know each other period. Because at the end of that 12 month candidacy period, after they've gone through the candidacy curriculum, uh, they have to choose. Are they going to pay $5,000 to buy one share of cooperative stock or not? And I so see. We, we don't give to so they have to give it. They don't pay the option. They have to buy it. The same way that when you start a business as an entrepreneur, you got you got to put some some financial right. skin in the game. I don't right. know the term, but it, but it makes sense and it really makes I kind of love people. that term. Because it makes you feel that risk. Yes, like, it does. Oh, I'm, yes, it does. I'm actually, this isn't just all fun. And, and, and I believe, personally, yeah. that if you, haven't, if you haven't earned something, if you haven't given something up to to, to, right. to get some, it, it doesn't. Right. You don't really feel like an owner. Yeah. You know, it doesn't. It's a relationship. You know. Like in the Petit Prince, the Little Prince, they say, you know, friendship is us establishing ties. Hmm. Like then you should put that in the guidebook because it's friendship isn't just like, hey, let's have fun and go to Dave and Buster's right. and whatever, and then it's over. It's just like you're actually making a commitment in a sense. Yes, and it's that again. We we don't try to to glorify. Right. The co-owner experience, it's tough. It's, it, you know, you, you know what it's like as an entrepreneur. Being a small business owner, being an entrepreneur, it is, it is tough. It requires grit. Yeah. It, there are some sleepless nights. Yeah. There are some tough things to get through. And, and I personally don't like the model of there's one owner who's a benevolent dictator and who kind of patronizes, takes care of all their employees. I'd rather just say, hey, let's all, put us all on, on equal footing. We're all co-owners in this together. Together we're going to get through thick and thin. We're going to enjoy the, the sunny weather and the stormy weather. So that all sounds good, but I can hear like libertarians or something out there saying, well, oh, what, you're going to have Elon Musk or, you know, Thomas Edison or any of these sort of revered founders like sit around a table and reach consensus with 11 other people who yeah. aren't. You, you don't have to do it that way. We're, we're talking about stock ownership of the company. Okay. You know, I'm and just trying to raise doubts. And now, and now Mr. Solar, we are a very democratic workplace, and I'll, and I'll, I'll talk about that okay. next. But we're just talking about who owns the stock. Okay. That doesn't mean that you get an equal say in how to run the company okay. necessarily. It means, you know, what are the types of things that stock, stockholders vote on? What are, the, what are the types of things that, whether or not you sell the company or voting for a board of directors? Okay. It's, uh, it, it's that, that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, you can take the, the, the sharing to the operational level. And Namaste Solar does that too. I think there, there are tremendous benefits for it. But this is not something that's coming from a place of altruism. It's not coming from a place of socialism. Somebody might look at it from that lens and say, and it might be valid, but this is coming from something different. We, we believe this is giving us a competitive advantage. Wow. To do That's so interesting. this way. We're doing it because we enjoy it more. The experience it's better, Jerry. I'm going to be the guy in charge. Like, that's not the kind of entrepreneurial experience I wanted, where I'm the guy in charge and all the ways I'm not You my didn't want that. I get, no, I didn't want that at all. Because you have a family to, and you want to be able to. That's one of the reasons. Relax and sleep. And that's one of the reasons. But also, I recognize I didn't have all those strengths within me. Right. Like my, I need. To, I like to be a part of a team, but I also need to be a part of a team because my strengths and weaknesses need to be complemented by other people's strengths and weaknesses. So, do you ever just say, "We're doing this"? When I was CEO, yeah, sometimes yeah. I would need to do that. Yeah, and, and my fellow co-owners empowered me with yeah. that responsibility or with that right. ability to be able to say, "Hey, we need to move quickly. Let's let's move forward. We're going right. to do this." Yeah. Huh. But I was held accountable by all my fellow co-owners. It, right. it was very much a, a democratic situation. This feels like you would almost have to like grow up in a family of 12 to be able to manage this. Like I'm an only child. I think it would be really difficult for me. It's difficult yeah. for me being an entrepreneur too. Yeah. That's why I'm so in love with this whole notion. Yeah. But it feels like you're trading one set of difficulties for another in a fun way. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair, fair way to say it. The, 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 the way I always put it is there's a package of pros and cons yeah. to each path forward yeah. that you want to do with your business. Yeah. There is no path that's only pros and no cons, right? This is the package of pros and cons that we prefer. And we can leverage that package of pros and cons to meet our business needs better, to outperform our competition, to, right. to get where we're trying to go with the kind of culture we want to have, with the kind of people that we want to attract and, and, and retain, and the kind of things that we want to do. So you just mentioned a few key things. So are you able to outperform your competition? Do you think this contributes to that and yeah. retention? Yes. 
Yeah, our retention is very high. Among wow. founders, it's 90% plus. Wow. In the solar industry, that's very rare because the solar industry is growing really quickly. Yeah. Someone who's got a few years of solar experience and they're, they're a veteran, that's very rare. So there's a lot of employee poaching going right. on. There's a lot of, uh, and whenever I go to a solar conference, most people are always, they have a different logo and a different business card. You know, they, they, every they time. jump ship yeah, every right. single time. It's free agency. We're, yeah, we, we, we want to attract and retain people who are committed and engaged to Namaste Solar over the long run. I want that too for Elephant, you know. Um, I think most companies really, when you start growing up like Elephant has in just the last few years, I feel like as a business, you start saying, oh, healthcare, benefits, retention. Yep. You know, these are important things, not just kind of trying to survive. Yep. You're actually trying to build a culture. And that's the small giant notion, which is a little bit of an in-joke that isn't that funny. But there's a book called Small Giants by Bill Burlingham, who's one of my idols. And yep. I just got to interview him and one of your idols, I think. Yeah, Bill Burlingham is fantastic. And he laid out, like, there's a set of companies, there's a type of company that if you look carefully, you can find. They're not usually... Um, what are they? They're not usually public, yep. so you don't hear about them as much. Yep. Um, but they're companies that are mission driven and protect that mission yes. and are successful yep. and have a company culture where retention yep. is high. And, and it's okay for another company to have different priorities. Like we want to sell in five years, or we want to grow as quickly as we possibly can and have an IPO. It, it's okay for other companies to have different goals. Right. That, that's not the goals for our, our company. Our company wants to be a small giant. Our company wants to be the best we can be. Our company wants to be an employee-owned cooperative that sets a positive example for how business can be done better than the conventional norm, but proving it over the long run that that's a better way to do it. I'm so grateful for what you just said. Like we just went to Natural Products Expo, and you know, Natural Products Expo. Like you think, as I used to think, that it's the coming together of environmentalism and business, and it's so inspiring, and it is in, in areas. Mm -hmm. um, it really is in areas. It, there's talks or lectures you go to or various companies I get to interview, particularly I get to handpick the small giants. Mm -hmm. But 95% of the companies, you know, are kind of just trying to grow and getting investment and then they sell to a larger company and, you know, it's just there's a process. And why that's so depressing or challenging for me is you look at climate change, you look at the challenges we have as a world. And these companies rarely are able to protect their missions. Yes, it, 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 uh, chasing the almighty dollar, the idea of you know, shareholder supremacy, where the, the sole reason for existence for right. most corporations is maximize profit for stockholders. Yeah, but it, it doesn't, doesn't make them evil. No, but no. it doesn't make them powerful for righting what's wrong. That's right. It doesn't make them as effective, right. and it, especially if that's the only if that's the only option. I think most entrepreneurs, most business school students think. Those are the only options on the menu, but that's not true. There are other options on the menu right. that I can choose from, yeah. and those options on the menu could cause you to be more successful in what you're trying to do, depending on who the entrepreneur is or the profession is. So I think that's that's what excites me the most. We need more visible, positive examples showing that there are other paths you can take, and that those paths, because of that choice that entrepreneurs, business owners can have, we can be more effective at solving some of the world's problems. So what are some of these models that you that you recommend people look at? Yeah, so employee ownership is a big one. I'm, I'm a big fan of employee ownership. It can be as simple as sharing ownership with some of your key employees. Mm -hmm. It can be as widespread as including everyone, like Namaste Solar tries to do. It can be... Everyone employee, who wants it. Everyone who wants it. That's yeah. right. It can be an employee stock ownership program, an ESOP. Those are, those are very, uh, very common. Actually, that's the majority of employee-owned companies, of which there are thousands in the United States, are... ESOPs. Yeah, so we knew those ESOP. Already. ESOP, Employee right. Stock Ownership Program. Yeah, I talked with Kim at New Belgium about the ESOP thing. They're a, good example video here in the comments. they're a good example here in Colorado. Yeah. Um, and, there, and, there, and there are lots of others. But that's not the only type. We're an employee owned cooperative, which is a very democratic style of employee ownership where it's one person, one share, one vote. Vote on what? On anything that stockholders operational? vote on. Operational? Oh, no. Anything that, anything that stockholders vote on. So not operational? No. But at Namaste Solar, we're also. So Employee ownership, that's one category. Another thing is democratic workplaces. So this is talking about not, not just governance and ownership, this is the operational level of things. We're, we're a democratic workplace. And a lot of people think, well, oh, democracy means you vote on everything. Yeah. No, that's not, that's not necessarily right. the case. You still have your yeah. job, I have my job. That's right, we've got our job roles, we've got uh, you know, the authority that's assigned to our job roles. Yeah. Uh, like the United States is a democracy. Do we vote on everything? No, we don't. Right. 
we, we have vote on uh, someone to be president and that president has four years, pretty much a, a lot of free reign, although there's some checks and balances. The Democratic workplace can be the same. And, and what really surprises me is how passionate the United States is, how passionate Americans are about democracy. Like we'll go to a war with another country in the name of saying, promote democracy. Promoting democracy. When it comes to the business world, where is it? We're like hardly dictatorship. Ever, dictatorships. It's all about dictatorships and command control and top down. And, and we've seen in political structures, that's not the most effective efficient way to get right. people working together, resources working right. together to do. Although Putin's doing quite well. <laughs> right. He can, you know? the, the, so when, when there's a benevolent dictator, uh, not saying Putin is, but yeah. when there's a benevolent dictator, a lot of people like that because things are good. But who's right. the successor? What happens next? You know, it's, well, it's a framework that's vulnerable to yeah. succession issues. And we've seen that like with the Dalai Lama in Bhutan, where these people have benevolent dictator kind of cred. And their move is to say, we will not be replaced by another dictator. We'll be yeah. replaced by a democracy. And they actually have been creating yeah. parliaments. And it's pretty cool. So, so in a democratic workplace, uh, one is there a forum for everybody to be heard, everybody's voice to be heard. And maybe you're not necessarily voting on something. Someone, you're not stifling those voices. You're, you want to you want to seek input and, and perspectives from as many people as you can, because that increases the chances that you'll find a better solution to whatever problem is here. And it helps retention, I'm sure. It helps retention big time. So and how... So transparency is another big democratic uh, principle. Okay. Uh, we share... There, there, is, there are no secrets in our company. Every single meeting is open. All company information is open. Everybody knows each other's pay. That is a, an important democratic principle for a democratic workplace, more so than I think than, than people voting on everything. I mean, that's... Pay is always the one where people are like, you know... People can't like forget to breathe. Like yeah. so, if oh, you're public cool. about your pay, yeah. you have to be able to justify it, obviously. Yeah. And you can't pay men more than women, right? Uh, you know, it's up. You got to explain it. But why are you going to pay Bob more than Sally? You know that is a big problem in, in the right. United States: pay disparity. And you can get away with that a lot more easily when only the company knows all the information and none of the employees do. And a lot of companies like Ben and Jerry's has tried this uh, with not much success, but I think. They still do it like 40 to 1 or something. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Bronner's, I think, does it. Maybe you know other examples. They ours, is, high. ours is 6 to 1. So okay. highest to lowest right. total pay. So 6 to 1. 6 to 1. Right now, our CEO only makes about five times the lowest paid person. And we set a minimum wage as well at $14 now, right. which is much higher than right. what entry level solar installers make other companies. Right. Cool. So yeah, minimum cool. wage is super important. Elephant does do that one. Um, and, and we do, you know, one of the biggest concerns I hear from other CEOs about workplace democracy is, wait a minute, it takes you longer to make your decisions. Right. There are some decisions where we do do it democratically. Uh, there are some decisions where we democratically empower a, a committee or a team or a group to do something, and right. then they've got that authority to, to move forward. But yes, it can take a little longer, but the, the chances of you getting a better solution are higher, and everyone's bought into it. Like you may have heard of the business, the conventional business term change management. So say you're two, we're two executives in our company. We made a decision really easily. It's just me and you. Right. But now we've got to convince everybody else to implement it. Uh -huh. And there's going to be some people who don't understand it. They right. don't understand the context, the background behind it. They think it's a dumb idea, so they're going to sandbag it. It's hard to get everyone on board to implement that. Right. In a democratic workplace, you just do all that ahead of time. And when you make your decision, it might take you a little bit longer. But then when you're ready to implement, right. boom. So you save time. Everyone's completely on board. Right. So if you, if you, the decision-making portion might take a little longer. The implementation is shorter. So if you put both of those together, the decision making plus the implementation is much faster in a democratic workplace. Not only is the implementation shorter, but the implementation actually happens. Yes. It happens more yeah. it, it, a higher and better, better quality. Yeah. Work, yes. So do you do that? I mean, I'm curious, I don't mean this is a joke, like at home. Like because I feel like there's some notion of people are like, well, sometimes tough decisions, people aren't gonna like it. Like yeah. if you're like, Johnny, go to bed, yeah. and Johnny's like, let's have a meeting and discuss this and yeah. vote on it. Like, do you ever just say, no, I mean, sometimes you have to yes. do things you don't want to do. And, and it helps when you've built up trust and right. credibility right. for the other times when you don't have to make a really fast decision or you don't have to say it's my way or the highway. Right. So a lot of this is building a culture of trust right. where people, people believe in it. Oh, trust. that's so nice. Yeah, leadership. Um, they understand that there are certain situations where you do need to move fast. Um, but I think that, that when you act in, in the situations that don't require that, that's, that's where you have an opportunity to build a really neat culture of engagement and trust and seeking other people's input. So for all the companies out there who are like, this sounds really interesting and inspiring like for me, um, but I don't know how to go down this road alone and I'm going to make so many mistakes and we don't even have time. We're just trying to like stay in business yeah. and pay people. 
what resources are out there? It's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and it's part of how the, 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 our business world is set up against it because there's so many ways where you can learn about conventional management techniques. Where can you learn about different management techniques for other companies in a different way? We did a lot of it by trial and error. That's, I think that's, that's okay. Um, that worked, worked well for us. You, you can seek out other, other role models um, by reading books like Wilbur and Liam's books. Uh, we loved meeting. Right, he has a book you were saying specifically on. Yeah, Bill Burlingham, Small Giants. Bill Burlingham co-wrote a book with Jack Stack, or two of them on employee ownership, okay. a great game of business, and a, a stake in the, in the game or a stake in the outcome. Um, and I think we have some of these books listed on our website. Okay. But th there's books. You can read a lot of books. They're really neat, neat magazines now, like Be the Change Media, um, Conscious Company Magazine, where you can read about different ways that other companies do it. And what that does is it gives you new vocabulary words to basically learn a new language. And once you get enough vocabulary words, then you can kind of choose your own adventure. By what, even if you don't exactly follow how another company is doing it, it does give you the building blocks that you need to kind of be creative and do it the way that you want to. Uh, we loved finding forums like the National Center for Employee Ownership and CEO. Right, go on. You go to, you go to uh, the NCEO conference and you meet all different kinds of employee-owned companies of all different types, flavors, shapes, and sizes, and you learn a lot from going to that. B Corp conference, where there's other certified B Corporations that are trying to do business in a different way, in a way that's good for What was the one right before B Corp? NCEO, the okay. National Center for Employee Ownership. And the B Corp, uh, for those who don't know, is, is that stand for benefit? It's for benefit? There's two things. One is there's a, a voluntary certification. It's called B Corp or B Corporation. It, it's like lead certification is for buildings, right? Organic certification is for food, fair trade. This is this is like fair trade or, or lead certification for triple bottom line companies. Triple bottom line being not just profit, but people, planet, profit. other stakeholders. Yeah. And, and that's what the B Corp movement is all about. Is right. that it's not just about maximizing profit for stockholders. B Corporations are companies that exist to, mac to provide benefits for all of their stakeholders. And other stakeholders are employees, the environment, your community, right. your vendors, right. investors, things like that. And that came out of the issue, the classic thing of where the factory is focused on profit, so they dump all their toxic chemicals in the river and then the town gets poisoned. So yep. just because they're not thinking about externalities. So. And, and they lay everyone off and then move to a you know, different right. location because they don't, they don't care about the right. community that they've been in for 30 years. Lots right. of different examples. Because, because they're only looking at profit. But if you look at people, planet profit, then you make different decisions. Yes. And you can actually be more sustainable and better retention on these things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, anything else we should touch on? Feels pretty good. For an introduction. Yeah, those are good ones. Yeah. Uh, Anything I'm not asking? Cool. Well, Blake, thank you again. Yeah, thanks for coming back. Show again. I really appreciate it. I feel like, sadly, right now, and I hope those who watch this will share it uh, with those who might benefit, that, like you said, people think of business as this, but there's this whole other possibility yep. that actually makes rational sense. I love your point that it's not just altruistic. And, and, and one other thing that I think is important. There are a lot of companies who feel like they have to do it the way it's always been done in order to attract capital. Uh -huh. Like if I want to grow, I'm gonna I need to go to venture capital uh, firms, or I need to private equity money, or I need to right. angel investors. Right? Yes, there is another way for that too. There okay. are impact investors. Okay, in, investors who are looking for investment opportunities that are aligned with their values. You work with a they're, fund, right? They're looking for these types of companies to invest in. They want to invest in employee owned companies. They want to invest in certified B corporations. They want to invest in companies that are doing good in the world, and they're, you, you can raise money from them, and there are a lot of positive examples, not just non-state solar and organic. Value. You raise money, right? Yep. Yeah. So we, we successfully raised $4.5 million from over 130 different investors in a very unique way. They, they, they have a class of non-voting preferred stock, so they have no vote. It pays a, a dividend target of 6.5%, and we're telling them we're never going to sell the company. You've got to be invested in our company for at least five years. I love that. A lot of CEOs are shocked to hear that there are investors out there who want to do that. And so they're looking at it as a bank account, basically, like an investment. Like you get your six and a half percent back, basically, yeah, and they're supporting it. It's, it, it's 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 a little bit like debt disguised as equity, right? But the point is, it's not it's not the getting cap like cap, getting capital from the usual suspects. These types of investors, they don't they're not forcing you to grow, grow, grow like hell, and then sell in five years, right? That they are wanting you to continue pursuing your mission and doing good in the world.
and they're willing to invest in you at the long run to do that. That's an important thing, I think, for us entrepreneurs, small business owners to hear is that they can find capital that will help them to pursue their mission. Whereas I think when you take capital from usual suspects, a lot of people feel, ah, oh, I'm going to have to compromise yeah. my mission. I'm going to have to do things differently than otherwise. I'm going to have to ship my products in plastic. It can't be organic. I need to lay some people off. Whatever. Yeah. That kind of yeah, stuff. I have to grow twice as fast as right. I have. Right. Exactly. Want to do all those kinds of things. I'm going to have to sell some. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So what is a fund like? How do people find investors like that? It's a it's a growing movement. I think if you Google impact investors okay. and start learning about the the, the firms, you know, the wealth management and investment advisors that that that, that focus on impact investing, you can go to, to conferences mm. where you know, like SOCAP is an interesting conference. Uh, uh, SRI, which used to stand for uh, socially responsible investing, now it's it's uh, it's it's broadened. But there are conferences where you can meet impact investors. You can meet other companies that have taken on impact investors. And I think you can just look for examples like Namaste Solar, Equal Exchange, Organic Valley, um, mm. Real Pickles. These are, I'm, I'm thinking of all cooperatives. Organic like, Valley, we can put in the comments, yeah. Yeah, uh, cooperatives have raised money this way, but there, there are a lot of companies that have done it. And, and uh, going to a B Corp conference, becoming a B Corp, there, there are a lot of investors and investment firms that are certified B Corps that are looking for other B Corps to invest in. Huh, yeah. oh cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then, yeah, I guess we could do a whole second video, which would take a long time on like walking through the steps of like how to become that kind of a company. Easy, yeah. But, yep. If you're going to have another time, yeah, you, exactly. You're gonna, you're gonna get Good man, Just thank about, you. Yeah. Blake Jones, check him out, Namaste Solar, and check out all the links in the comments. Hope you enjoy. Yeah.